Dave Rubin might seem like a strange person to create so much controversy over himself. He seems like a pretty bland, inoffensive guy. He doesn't swear or yell, and most importantly, he's just a regular liberal who's interested in promoting the free exchange of ideas. To me, there is literally nothing more important in a democracy than free speech and debate. We should debate everything. We should talk about everything. We should engage in ideas that we aren't comfortable with, and we should let the best ideas win. However, for those paying attention, Rubin has created a lot of controversy around himself. He's been attacked by former fans, Anna Kasparin from the Young Turks, and even people who say they're his fans are mocking him. Regressive, regressive, PC culture, regressive, regressive left. And of course, there's that infamous Reddit AMA. But we'll get back to that in a bit. Rubin's critics have levied all sorts of criticisms against him, but Rubin's worst problem could be summed up as dishonesty. Rubin, through the statements he makes, the people he chooses to platform, the issues he chooses to cover, and the issues he chooses to ignore, works almost exclusively to benefit the right wing and right wing ideas. Meanwhile, the whole time, refusing to be labeled as right wing himself. In fact, Rubin has threatened to sue people who have labeled him as being right wing, and if you challenge him on that, he'll be glad to present his liberal credentials to set you straight. One criticism that I hear occasionally is that I'm actually not a real liberal and I'm secretly a conservative. Or sometimes they'll say I'm the only thing worse than a conservative, a dreaded right winger. Well, since we have so many new subscribers around here, I thought I'd lay out some of my liberal cred for you in case you missed it. I'm so for gay marriage that I even married a guy. I'm pro-choice, I'm against the death penalty, I'm for a social safety net. I'm for a strong public education system. I'm for legalizing marijuana. I'm for reforming our prison system. And I'm against unnecessary wars and nation building. Now, it's not just us lefties who believe that Rubin is faking his political identity to benefit the right wing. Right wingers think that Rubin is faking it too. Except they love it. I I want you to continue to say you're, you're a liberal because you're yeah. you're of great use uh, to to good values. Well, don't worry, I'm not doing it for my, for your use I of me. Know I'm doing that. I'm doing I it know. for myself. No, I no, no, no. Yeah. It's like Christians who say to me, you know, oh, we would love you to come to Christ, but you are so valuable to us as a Jew when you defend us Christians. Yeah. And they're right. You are valuable in, in the best sense of the word. This is essentially what makes Rubin so controversial. For those who can see past Rubin's vacant smiles, appeals to vague ideas, and apparent centrism, you can see that Rubin's constant self-identifying as a liberal serves a very deliberate purpose. Rubin may not be able to articulate policy positions when pushed, but when he's on his own turf, he knows exactly what he's doing. I hope that this video can be a primer on why Rubin is so controversial, and I think just by showing Rubin's own statements, we can show that Rubin, one, strategically and dishonestly plays the part of the neutral observer, but only to benefit the right wing, two, actively tries to move the center of discussion further and further to the right, three, actively keeps his audience focused on the worst elements of the left, while ignoring or minimizing the faults of the right, and four, works to promote and provide cover for right wing ideas, all while refusing to own up to them himself. So first of all, what evidence is there to say that Rubin is right wing? Rubin loves to label himself as being on the left, or at the very least, being a liberal. However, from the very beginning, Rubin has made it clear that he has a few problems with the left. In fact, Rubin seems to have a lot of criticisms of the left. The modern left has become about collectivism. They do not judge you as an individual. They look at you, and if you're black, they think you should look, or you should think a certain way. And especially if you're a white man, you're the, you're the most heterosexual, cisgendered, they love all their phrases, yeah. then you're really the evil thing. Because I think people are so sick of what the Democratic Party has embraced, which is identity politics. It's this oppression Olympics narrative. It's that government is the answer to everything. It's this democratic socialism or socialist democratism, uh, whatever you want to call it, which they'll drop the, uh, the Democratic Party as soon as they're in power. Look, on the left right now, You've got the the far leftists, the democratic socialists, whatever they are. And then you've got the couple liberals that are trying to figure out who they are and where they are and where they should be. And that's it, that, that really is it. But in terms of what the discussion is on the left, it's either you buy identity politics, you buy that the America is an evil patriarchy and all of those things, or you're pretty much on the outs. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That is the 180 to what Bernie says. Bernie wants to, your government to give you things. All of these things, they all sound good it all sounds good diversity and equality it all it's all buzzwords that all sound great but it's me it's not only meaningless it's much more dangerous than meaningless it's actually 
it's actually perverse and it's actually antithetical to freedom. The biggest problem we have right now is that the ideas of the left, of a bigger state, of taking more, of the collective versus the individual, I, these ideas of the left, I think are a far bigger, because they've taken such root with young people, I think they're a far bigger threat to the future of this pluralistic, wonderful society that we have than anything that I see coming out of the right at the moment. Now, as a leftist myself, I can agree that there are a lot of good and valid criticisms that can be made against the left. However, remember that Ruben insists that he is a liberal and not a conservative, and that as a talk show host, he's really a neutral, objective observer. <laughs> My interview style, I've said this many times, is I believe that the best way to interview somebody is to really be able to hear what they think, and the way you do that is you listen. My belief is that if you let people speak, you can either figure out if they know what they're talking about or not. However, if he's really as liberal and objective as he says he is, we can expect him to be just as critical, if not more critical, when it comes to the right. After all, Ruben promised. Rule number four, I won't be a partisan hack. So what kind of things does Ruben have to say about the right? When there is a disagreement, I see way more people on the right, conservatives or libertarians, more often willing to agree to disagree rather than to defriend or to smear. Could the right be better? Are there real bigots on the right? Absolutely. And are there real racists on the right? Yes, of course, without question. But by and large, these aren't the voices from the mainstream right anymore. As I've, as I've been saying, and I think I said in the speech, it's like there's int intellectual flexibility on the right. And currently on the left, there is none. I hope it will come back. Um, but you know, Martin Luther King Jr. wanted his children not to be judged by the color of their skin, but their content of their character. That's a conservative principle right now. Yeah, so you talked to me a little bit about the primary, that was your primary issue with the left. What about the right? What's like the one issue that you have the biggest problem with? <sighs> you know, somebody asked me that in the Q&A, and it's a great question, because at the moment, I don't have major pro Look, there's a bit of a, of a, a little bit of a, like, a religious tone with the, with the right that I don't love. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, they're not really doing anything about it. They're not yeah. pushing their religion on anybody. Right. So even that, I've seen the right change. You know, the right changed basically on gay marriage because they embraced the right. libertarian argument on it, which is that the government should stay out of your private life. So Ruben seems to have a lot of problems with the left, and when asked, can't even provide any substantive critique of the right. I usually like to take people at their word, but Ruben's actions and statements are simply not consistent with his constant claims that he's a liberal. Before we continue, I think it's important to make note of something, and that is in September. September of 2016, Dave Rubin began being funded by the Koch brothers. This was announced in September as a partnership with Learn Liberty, a website run by the Institute for Humane Studies, which is funded by Charles Koch, a prolific donor to right-wing causes. It was only a few months later that Rubin showed up on PragerU, talking about why he left the left. Today's progressivism has become a faux moral movement hurling charges of racism, bigotry, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, and a slew of other meaningless buzzwords at anyone they disagree with. It was also right around this time that he changed his positions on a lot of other things. James Lay asked, how likely do you think that Bernie Sanders will be the next president? Uh, if you guys know anything about me at this point, you know that I do like Bernie. He's the guy that I, pretty much everything he says, I pretty much agree with. I don't know that we could pay for all of it, but I'm pretty much there. <laughs> These ideas of the left, I think, are a far bigger, because they've taken such root with young people, I think they're a far bigger threat to the future of this pluralistic, wonderful society that we have than anything that I see coming out of the right at the moment. It's also important to know that before his political shift, Dave Rubin worked with TYT, a progressive news organization with a large online presence. This is a fact that Rubin gets to appeal to when talking about his split from the left and it's a very important factor in what makes him so appealing. It's a great add-on to his status as a progressive apostate. Rubin's identity as a liberal who left the left because the left became too crazy is the first vital ingredient to his appeal to right-wingers. Any right-winger can criticize the left, and there are plenty of places where you can get that, but of course right-wingers will criticize the left. They're on the right. It's a special treat to be told that the left-wing is so crazy, so far off the spectrum, that even a liberal like Dave Rubin can see that the left has just lost its mind and that even as a liberal, he can see that conservatives are right about just about everything. The right is more reasonable, they're more tolerant, they're just better. However, this gives Rubin a problem. He wants to keep supporting conservatives and attacking the left, yet he still wants to portray himself as being on the left, or at least not being on the right. 
How can he maintain this position when he keeps supporting the right and attacking the left? Well, Ruben has a solution to this problem, and it's one he likes to mention all the time. As I've been saying for a year now, if you're an old school liberal, then an old school conservative is no longer your enemy. I really think a new center can arise from this, and if Trump is smart, he can actually make that happen. You see, it's not Ruben who has dishonestly changed his positions for his own benefit. It's that the left has moved so far left that Ruben and many others are now in the new center. Now, there are a number of people who Ruben thinks are in this new center just like him. So what kind of policy positions characterize this new center? Who does Ruben politically identify with? When we examine this new center, this new center of Ruben seems to be really, really right wing. Let's take a look at who Ruben includes in this new center, shall we? Most of us are not the alt-right or the regressive left. Most of us don't care what you do in the privacy of your own home, and we want government to take less instead of giving more. With all this in mind, I've got the perfect guest for you this week, radio host and columnist Ben Shapiro. We're both on the outside looking in, and that's exactly where I think we can start building bridges. Okay, so he seems to think that Ben Shapiro is in the new center. Who else? What about Paul Joseph Watson, a partner of Alex Jones who was famous for claiming that soy is being used to feminize men, saying conservatism is the new counterculture, and for making a video called The Truth About Gender, although when he first posted it, it was called Why Women Suck at Sports. What does Ruben think of him? So where do you actually consider yourself politically? I, I think I have a good sense, and one of the things we've been talking about here is sort of this new growing center, people who really want to stand up for free speech. Okay, what about Stefan Molyneux, a man who has interesting ideas about women? Women who choose the assholes will fucking end this race. They will fucking end this human race if we don't start holding them a fucking countable. Women who choose assholes guarantee child abuse. Women who choose assholes guarantee criminality, sociopathy, politicians, all the cold-hearted jerks who run the world came out of the vaginas of women who married assholes. And I don't know how to make the world a better place without holding women accountable for choosing assholes. And an unhealthy preoccupation with race. Okay, so we've talked about the family, and that's one of the things people find controversial about you. I think really, though, the one that you didn't mention is the race and IQ stuff. Mm. This is something you, you dive into a lot, mm. and I think people think that there is somehow a racist element to it. Mm. So I don't want to put any words in your mouth, so do you want to make your basic argument around race and IQ? You've got uh, your run-of-the-mill vanilla Caucasians coming in at 100, and then uh, below like a mestizos or, or uh, Hispanics sometimes called 85. 90 and so on and then you've got blacks uh, in in uh, North America particularly uh, uh, African Americans coming in at, at, at 85 so there is this range it is unbelievably heartbreaking I mean just just I'm straight up about all of this like this is one of the most difficult facts I've ever had to absorb in my life I've always been skeptical of the ideas of white nationalism of identitarianism and white identity However, I am an empiricist, and I could not help but notice that I can have peaceful, free, easy, civilized, and safe discussions in what is essentially an all-white country. So five years ago, where liberals and conservatives were just fighting about everything, now actually there's a new center developing, and I think both of us are sort of in. So all of these people Ruben considers to be in the new center share several traits. All of them share an intense dislike for liberals and the left, and an intense opposition to feminism and social justice. Framing these people as being in the center instead of being on the right is just one way that Ruben sanitizes his right-wing guests, and helps to make them more palatable to his audience. So how does Ruben get away with platforming and bundling himself in with these kinds of people? How does he justify placing these people in the center of the political spectrum? Well, to make sure that you don't let this talk of race and IQ get you nervous, he needs to make sure that you never, ever lose sight of the worst elements of the left. And Ruben has several methods of making sure this is the case. First, Ruben will never miss a chance to remind you, the viewer, that what you're about to hear on his show is what they don't want you to know. 
Yeah. All right. Well, we have a lot to get to, and I, re I really want to talk about the book. But I thought the best way to sort of start this is that I know I'm going to get a certain amount of hate just for sitting across from you. Your Neg negative right. opinions about a, a free thinker uh, on the internet? I think actually pre-internet it was Socrates and then, you know, Copernicus. Now, I have a feeling that I'm going to be in a lot of trouble just for having this book on the table, just for putting this book that you've written right in between us, people are gonna be angry right off the bat. Nah. So a guy like Tommy Robinson, he, you know, I got a lot of shit for having him on just for talking to the guy. Who is this nebulous they who is out there attacking? Well, it's the regressive left, of course, and they want to come after you and silence you just for being open-minded enough to hear new ideas. When I realized that that really had sort of taken over the left and that there really was no willingness to agree to disagree. Just by saying what I thought, I realized that there were literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who were thinking the same thing. But they had been so locked because of political correctness and a, and a fear of saying whatever they think. I think I've shown some people that you can say what you Open think too. Open the door to that conversation, yeah. yeah. And they're not, gonna, they're not gonna come kill you, just well, yeah. You know, I talk about the culture of fear right now of why pe so many people email me and they say, well, I'm afraid to say this or I'm afraid to post your video on Facebook or any of this stuff. And I think it's because everyone fears this retribution. Yeah. Just imagine if that had been you for a moment. This is what I mean when I say that this regressive movement will come for all of us one day. I suspect that it's coming for private citizens for wrong think next. We'll just have to wait and see. And if you doubt this, remember, the left control everything, including the internet. While I still focus a lot on the left on all this stuff, it's because that's where all of, all of the media is there, all of the academia is there. All of the mainstream everything is all being controlled by this horrific ideology that I truly believe could, could alter and destroy this country, all of the freedoms that we have. Oh, and if any one of you in the audience begins to notice that Ruben's new center is really far to the right, it's really only because the left has just gone insane and moved too far to the left. Oh, and don't worry so much about the fascistic tendencies on the right, they're, they're not important. Also, Stefan Molyneux being in the new center doesn't make the new center right wing because Stefan's ideas about race and IQ are actually leftist ideas. So for the real, the race realists or the white supremacists or the real far right people who want America to be a white ethno state, which is completely against uh, the founding documents and that everything that America is and is not conservative by any stretch of the imagination. If anything, oddly, that's more left if you really think about it, because that's about big government making decisions about people. If you want people to truly be free, which is freedom, ultimate freedom, is on the right. I've always been skeptical of the ideas of white nationalism, of identitarianism, and white identity. However, I am an empiricist, and I could not help but notice that I could have peaceful, free, easy, civilized, and safe discussions in what is essentially an all-white country is the race and IQ stuff. Mm. This is something you, you dive into a lot. Mm. And I think people think that there is somehow a racist element to it. Okay, so I think it's clear by now that Ruben is very sympathetic to the right wing, even if he's disingenuous about it. But it's one thing to be right wing. It's another to be a lazy propagandist. So why am I calling him the lazy propagandist? You see, there's nothing inherently wrong with being sympathetic to one political side more than another. But there is something wrong with pretending to be on the side you're arguing against as a rhetorical tactic. Dave Rubin does a lot to benefit the right wing, but unlike other right wingers, most of what he does isn't going out there and making the arguments for right wing positions. Most other people who try and argue for a position go about it by making the arguments themselves. They go through the work of trying to find evidence that supports their position and delivering the evidence in a compelling way. Rubin doesn't do any of that. Instead, the entire point of Dave Rubin's career the reason he is so valuable to the right wing, and the reason why he keeps insisting that he's a liberal, is because he has one job. Not to argue for right wing points of view, but to provide legitimacy for those who do. To examine how Rubin accomplishes this, let's take a look at one interview that Dave Rubin did with Katie Hopkins, a far right media personality. One of the things that I've seen on Twitter, which I think is truly one of the most outrageous, ludicrous, insane things that I've seen on Twitter, has been a few times where, which is the which is the local police that have- Oh, uh, so London is Met Police, the Metropolitan yeah. Police come for me. So I'm not in their area. So but. you've tweeted things, whatever it is that you've tweeted, and then they've requested that people- uh, Report. Report you and find other things that you've said and all this stuff for hate speech or whatever terms that they're using. 
even though, as you've said, I've done no violence, I'm not calling for violence, no. blah, 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 blah. No. And they're literally word police now. Yeah, so the word police are strong. Now, notice that Ruben isn't being the neutral objective observer that he claims to be here. Ruben didn't ask Hopkins a question, but instead is actively making assertions to benefit his guest. Ruben asserts that the word police has come after Hopkins, and Ruben tells the audience that Hopkins has never called for any violence. When talking about what other people say about her tweets, Ruben puts finger quotes around hate speech and says that the fact that the police have looked into Hopkins' tweets is outrageous, ludicrous, and insane. Dave Rubin has perfectly set up his audience to believe that all Hopkins did was tweet out some normal conservative opinions, tweets that aren't calling for violence, tweets that aren't even hate speech, and yet the Orwellian leftist word police came after her. Sounds bad, right? Of course, what Rubin isn't telling you is what Hopkins actually did tweet. So let me be the one to show you what that tweet was. 22 dead. Number rising. Showfield. Don't you even dare. Do not be part of the problem. We need a final solution. Now, I don't know about Ruben, but I don't know how a person can call for a final solution without calling for some kind of violence, or at least heavily implying it. What else has Hopkins, the free speech hero, been oppressed for? So then I write a column in a national newspaper, one of the papers I used to work for, and that column became the focus of the head of the uh, UNHR. Um, and he said that I was one of the causes of all of the issues against multiculturalism in the UK. I was uh, brought in under caution by the Major Crime and Homicide Command, interviewed by two people on a tape, and then that was taken to the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, to see if I would go up to be put, given jail time for a column in a national paper. Who is policing the police? I mean, I, he, the guy didn't break any law, as far as I can tell by anything that you just said. No. There, you didn't break any law. No, I haven't. I've seen similar things, I think, with Anne-Marie Waters. I mean, just the collection of people, regardless of what you think of them, that the law is being turned against them for nothing illegal. I mean, is anyone policing the police? Is this an issue that anyone's picking up? Are, are any liberals talking about this? No. So Katie Hopkins states that she's been investigated just for writing a column for a newspaper. Now, the paper that Hopkins used to write for is The Sun, a notoriously conservative paper who found her column so extreme that even they deleted it. But a college made a text copy of the column, presumably for a class on journalism or something. Link in the description. Let's see what all this fuss is about. Katie Hopkins, April 17th, 2015, The Sun. Rescue boats? I'd use gunships to stop migrants. No, I don't care. Show me pictures of coffins, show me bodies floating in the water, play violins and show me skinny people looking sad. I still don't care. Because in the next minute, you'll show me pictures of aggressive young men at Kalai, spreading like norovirus on a cruise ship. Watching them try to clamber onto British lorries and steal their way into the UK, do I feel pity? Only for the British drivers who get hit with a fine every time one of this plague of feral humans ends up on their truck. Understand this. These two populations are the same. The migrants harassing Brit truckers at the port are the same as the vagrants making the perilous trip across the Med. And there is no stopping them. 170,000 came last year. During a recent operation by the Italian Coast Guard to rescue migrants off the coast of Libya, the people traffickers threatened the crew of Kalishnikovs to get their vessel back. Clearly, boats are in short supply. And that is a good thing. No boats, no migrants. There is a simple solution to this. It's time for the Italians to stop singing opera, drinking espresso, and looking chicken chuffing everything. It's time to get Australian. Australians are like British people, both balls of steel, can-do brains, tiny hearts, and whacking great gunships. Their approach to migrant boats is the sort of approach we need in the Med. They threaten them with violence until they bugger off, throwing cans of Castlemaine in an Aussie version of Sharia stoning. And their approach is working. Migrant boats have halved in numbers since Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott got tough. We don't need another rescue project. The now defunct 7 million euro a month Mayor Nostrum, Italy's Navy search and rescue operation, was paid for in part by British taxpayers. And we don't need a campaign from Save the Children to encourage more migrants to take the journey. What we need are gunships sending these boats back to their own country. You want to make a better life for yourself? Then you'd better get creative in Northern Africa. Britain is not El Dorado. We are not Elysium. Some of our towns are festering sores, plagued by swarms of migrants and asylum seekers shelling out benefits like Monopoly money. Make no mistakes. These migrants are like cockroaches. 
They might look like Bob Geldof's Ethiopia circa 1984, but they are built to survive a nuclear bomb. They are survivors. Once gunships have driven them back to their shores, boats need to be confiscated and burned on a huge bonfire. Drilling a few holes in the bottom of anything suspiciously resembling a boat would be a good idea too, just for belt and braces. Unless we take the emotion out of this and start connecting the migrants and the med with the Africans clinging to trucks and Kalai, we cannot deliver an appropriate response. If you think rescue boats are a good idea, you may as well set up a Libya to Italy P&O ferry service and send your taxes to Africa by direct debit for good measure. Or, if you think like me, then it's time to get Australian, bring on the gunships, force migrants back to their shores and burn the boats. As it turns out, I do care. I care passionately about British truckers and taxpayers in the UK. So, we can see, Katie Hopkins is clearly calling for violence in no uncertain terms, saying we need to threaten migrants with violence, just like the Australians, and comparing them to cockroaches and calling them feral humans. By the way, Hopkins was just interviewed by the police. She was never arrested, she wasn't given any jail time, and there weren't any charges against her. But obviously, Ruben doesn't mention any of this. He doesn't ask about what Hopkins tweeted, he doesn't ask her to clarify about what she wrote in her column that created so much controversy, or why the police may have felt a need to question her. Ruben doesn't even consider the possibility that perhaps there was a reason why the public reacted to Hopkins in the way they did. Instead, Ruben lies by omission, misleading his audience into believing that Hopkins was just a regular conservative who has been oppressed by the leftist thought police. Look, Ruben could have let his audience know about what Hopkins wrote and still said that the police shouldn't have even interviewed Hopkins on free speech grounds, but Ruben didn't do that because he knows that's not as compelling as his oppressed conservative narrative. Pleasure talking to you, and I think more, oh, than, any, more than anything else, because of the fact that I see what people say about you and all of those things, and I've had this a few mm -hmm. times on the show where I have invite guests on that people say horrible things, and then you sit across from somebody for an hour, and unless, you're, just unless, regular you're, dude. unless you're the charlatan of all time, <laughs> I, I see a pretty decent person there trying to be some good. So, <laughs> Thank uh, you. Ruben knows exactly what he is doing here. Ruben through as many statements and the way that he frames all of his questions, has prepared his audience to believe that the left is a hysterical juggernaut, ready to use the power of targeted harassment, name calling, and the government to silence conservative voices, all because the left has no rational response to what the right is saying. The way that Rubin brought up Hopkins writings was the perfect way to build onto this narrative. Rubin knows that telling his audience the truth about what really got Hopkins into trouble would make his narrative impossible to defend, and even worse, hearing how extreme Hopkins really is would have scared away the uninitiated. Now, the interview that we just examined between Rubin and Hopkins is a prime example of how he creates legitimacy for right-wingers, and it's exactly what he's being paid for. Katie Hopkins is a despicable crackpot, but after being given the Rubin treatment, She's a principled and brave defender of free speech who has been oppressed by the Orwellian leftist word police, all for expressing her harmless opinions on Twitter. However, when it comes to sanitizing right-wing views for consumption, Rubin has another trick up his sleeve. When you watch enough Dave Rubin interviews, you will notice a theme where Dave Rubin constantly brings up a certain group of people who hates him and his guests. He'll always bring up how viciously and unfairly they attack himself and his guests, but he never brings up any of the actual arguments people make against them. But I never, from what I've seen, I've never seen blatant racism or anti-Semitic stuff or uh, Islamophobia is not a word, but I, I really haven't seen that. No, um, I, I, it's not the truth so, uh, of So me. are you not a bigoted racist, Islamophobic, <laughs> homophobic? Uh, I don't mind, you I, know. I think I, most people, I think a lot, I know a lot of my audience is going to hear you, really hear you, and go, this is the type of stuff that I think needs to be heard more. And I think that the group of people that are talking about this stuff is actually growing. I, I do mm -hmm. see this. At the same time, the people who don't want to hear us are getting more and more hysterical because that's all they got left. Oh no. Dave is right. I can't refute anything that Tommy Sotomayor is saying. I don't have any arguments or facts to contradict him. All I can say is... is... <laughs> Homosexual says, well, you should accept my lifestyle. But if you say, well, I accept your lifestyle, I just don't want my kid to be one. Well, you're a bit. Well, wait a minute. I accept the fact that you want to be homeless. I don't want my kid to be homeless. <laughs> I accept the fact that you want to smoke crack. I don't want my kid to smoke crack. Hell, I have two daughters. I don't want them dating someone who's, who's poverty stricken. What does that make me? <laughs> now, I know what people are going to say. They're going to say, well, wait a minute. You can't say that because Jews 
and the Holocaust, and they didn't choose to be in the Holocaust. Yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. They were the Jews did the same thing. They literally could have walked out of that mm -hmm. situation and said, we don't want to do it. No. But that ain't what they said. But that's a place where we should want to push education. Like you as a white man should want to push whites in America to become to concentrate more on uh, education because Jews push that to their people. And then oh, they push yeah. alcohol to your people in mind. They push drugs to your people in mind, but they push education to theirs. I want you guys to understand, Jews are financing black folks genocide. This is what's happening. They're financing your genocide. She fat. Don't put your fat stuff on Instagram. She's fat. That fat girl. She fat and she can't swim. The Oompa Loompa is about to get in the water. You see, it's a common practice for interviewers to bring up common criticisms or controversies that their guests have been involved in. Usually, they will present the details of the criticisms for the audience to get the whole picture, and then allow the guests to respond to the criticism or controversy. Dave Rubin doesn't do this. Instead, he does a twisted, insulting parody of this technique, where he sums up all criticisms of his guests and himself as only being hysteria and name-calling. Dave never presents the actual arguments or criticisms against his guests, or even plays devil's advocate. He never lets the audience know that Katie Hopkins wrote all those truly hateful and odious things, because in the world of the Rubin Report, the only criticisms of Katie Hopkins and the rest of his conservative guests that exist is hysterical name-calling. Now at this point, maybe it's a good idea to hear Rubin's response to these criticisms. After all, I'm far from the only one who has criticized Rubin, and indeed, we got to hear what Dave has to say about his criticisms in the AMA. Now, when Rubin did a Reddit AMA on r slash classical liberals, he probably wasn't expecting a huge amount of current and former fans to come with criticisms, and good ones too. It's important to note that the questioners in this AMA aren't a bunch of leftists like me. A lot of them are current and former fans who have noticed inconsistencies in Rubin's statements, and they use a lot of examples and citations in their critiques. The important thing though is that we get to hear Rubin himself reply to these criticisms. Here's the most popular question from the AMA. Thanks for doing this AMA, Dave. You talk a lot about your interview style being about giving guests enough rope to hang themselves, which I think is a great concept. We know that the general population does not have time to research each and every claim that they hear, so therefore, people regularly believe fake news. As an example, in your interview with David Horowitz, he said that Obama is a communist. And that's how I know that Barack Obama is a communist. But instead of asking a follow-up to explain why he thinks that, you moved on to other topics. Do you worry that misinformation can be spread if falsehoods go unchallenged without further questioning? Dave's response. In that specific instance, he kind of tossed it in mid-sentence and quickly moved on to other things. That's his opinion and you can judge him accordingly, as you obviously do. I like hearing what and how people think, and sometimes berating people isn't the best way to do that. But I'm just doing this the best way I see how and that may not be for everyone. I'm really okay with that. So, as other commenters quickly pointed out, this is a dodge. No one ever asked Ruben to berate anyone, but simply to follow up on a claim. Now, Ruben was asked this again by David Pakman in an interview one month later, where he gave a more elaborate answer. Let's check that out really quick, because I think the way that Ruben answers here is very telling. What some might perceive as not challenging guests when when maybe they deserve to be challenged yeah well first can you can you give me an example of that uh sure so like for example when you had uh david horowitz on and he said obama's a communist and he did include it in a sentence where he said a lot of things that were untrue you could have i guess conceivably picked out any of those things but it was just sort of allowed to slide where if if you had a different style you might have said can you tell me what obama has done that makes him uh, a communist. Okay, so I don't. So first off, David Horowitz saying that Obama is a communist—that's his opinion of what he thinks about Obama. I mean, of course, that, I don't yeah. know that you could say. I, it's I factually say debunkable, though, right? You could say, well, if someone is a communist, there must be something you can attribute to them that would be communistic. First, Rubin tries to say that Horowitz calling Obama a communist is just his opinion. But Pacman immediately pushes back, saying that calling Obama a communist is a claim that should have some corroborating evidence behind it. Then, Rubin tries something else. 
Ruben gives the answer that he gave before in the AMA. <laughs> My interview style, I've said this many times, is I believe that the best way to interview somebody is to really be able to hear what they think, and the way you do that is you listen. So Ruben, similarly to his AMA, states that he believes the best way to interview someone is to allow them to freely speak their mind. This is fine by itself, but the problem is, he immediately contradicts himself afterward. Now, when David Horowitz, in this specific instance, when he said that communist thing, I was in that particular case, I was about to stop him. But you're right, he then did quickly, he like sort of said it, it was right at the top of the interview, he kind of flew right into something else. And then, and then the conversation just went from there. Mm -hmm. I do remember thinking in the interview that I wanted to get back to it, but in the course of an hour conversation, or I think that one was almost an hour and 20 minutes, uh, you know, sometimes something's gonna get lost. Right after stating his belief in letting guests speak freely, Ruben says that he was about to stop Horowitz, but he couldn't because the conversation was moving too quickly and he never got the chance. So which is it, Dave? Should you let your guests speak freely or did you want to push for more elaboration? More importantly, Dave Ruben is lying here Ruben claimed that he was going to push back on Horowitz in the given interview, but that he couldn't because the conversation was just moving too quickly, and he never got the chance. Let's see what actually happened in this interview. I, I, my mission was to warn other people, and that's how I know that Barack Obama is a communist. All right, so wait, let's, let's pause before we jump to, to modern day, because everything that you just described there was why I thought your bio was so interesting, yeah. because you grow up with communists, you know, now I didn't I'm know about the guy. This is nothing like the excuse that Ruben gave to both Pac-Man and his viewers on Reddit. Ruben makes it seem like Horowitz's communist comment was just something he threw in with a lot of information, and that the conversation was just flowing too fast for Ruben to stop and ask about it. But in the interview, right after Horowitz calls Obama a communist, Ruben immediately stops him. And that's how I know that Barack Obama is a communist. All right, so wait, let's, let's pause before we jump to, to modern day. Ruben has every chance to ask Horowitz to clarify on his comment, but instead, he changes the subject to Horowitz's biography. Because everything that you just described there was why I thought your bio was so interesting, yeah. because you grow up... Now, is this one thing really this important? Not by itself, no, but here's the thing. Ruben, when asked about this oversight, gives three different mutually exclusive reasons for why he didn't push back on Horowitz. First, he tries to say that Horowitz calling Obama a communist is just an opinion. When pushed back on that, Ruben pivots and says that his interview style is to allow guests to freely speak without any pushback. However, after being pushed back on that, Ruben pivots again and finally says that he was going to push back on Horowitz, but he didn't have the opportunity to, which was a lie. Just ask yourself this, why did Ruben feel the need to give three different answers to this issue? Why did he feel the need to lie about what happened? He could have just said, hey, sorry, I know I messed up that interview, but I would do better in the future. But no, he lied. Now, this is a little bit of conjecture on my part, but I think it's because Ruben knows that he has a huge bias towards the right wing. And this is just one instance where he showed his bias a little too obviously. And now he's defensive about it. Because now he knows that everyone else knows that he has a huge bias. Because while he wants to let Horowitz call Obama a communist with no pushback whatsoever, he's not so tolerant when his other guests start criticizing the right. Trump begins by beating the Republican world. He, bins, he begins by defeating Fox News and bending all of them to his will. Now, he had no idea what he was talking about. He had no plan for executing any of this. But he do, do you think that's really true? Because I hear this with a lot of people, that he had either no idea what he was doing or he had that no, there was no plan or anything. Some of that's hard no, for me. To, idea. Yeah. He reveals that every day. He doesn't know, he doesn't understand any... I, but what does that say about all of us? If I, that's true, like, if that's I true, what does that if say one about... Of the, if you were to take the thousand people in the United States who know most about Medicare and Medicaid, or the hundred who know most about Medicare and Medicaid, mm -hmm. I'm guessing 90 of the hundred, and nine, 990 of the thousand, maybe not, maybe 900 of the thousand, would be people of the center left because conservatives just don't care about that, that, that kind of knowledge. And so they're always at a disadvantage. So well, is it they, that they don't care or they just don't think the government should be involved in this? Like that the fundamental belief okay, well, first well, okay, is that, that it's not the job of the government, really. But you have to delve to deal with this problem. You have to delve into detail in a way that the conservative preference for ideology over factual specificity makes conservatives not very useful at.
Is, is anyone good at that these days though? Really? Let's take a look at one more question from the AMA. Thanks for taking our questions, Ruben. Love the show. After the election, you said you would be the first to hold Trump's feet to the fire once he's in office, since so many people were going apeshit before anything happened. I'll be the first to hold Trump's feet to the fire once he's in office. If Trump does something wrong, does something illegal, immoral, any of that, I will be the first to hold his feet to the fire. I heard you say on your recent stream with Sargon that it's not necessary to criticize Trump because so many other outlets are already doing so. Does this hurt your show's integrity with regards to being about big ideas and building bridges between the various ideologies? It seems to me that your show can be critical of the failings on all sides, but as it currently stands, you heavily focus on the left. Ruben's response? There are literally hundreds of outlets dedicated to attacking Trump 24-7. I didn't vote for him. I brought on people who were for and against him before the election and will continue to do so. As for what he has done so far, I haven't seen much worth going crazy over, so I've tried to stay even keeled. I think the issues of postmodernism and the, the left are a much bigger danger to the future of Western civilization. This is a complete dodge. As others pointed out, there are also countless podcasts and shows about talking about political correctness run amok. So why should Dave spend time criticizing that? Another questioner asked something similar. You said you'd be the first to hold Trump's feet to the fire, but you haven't really done so. Does that mean you're happy with his presidency? Here's Dave Rubin's answer. I think his presidency has basically been fine, but it's impossible to grade because of the non-stop hysteria. This might be an okay answer if it came from a layman, but isn't discussing politics and cutting through the bullshit Rubin's job? After all, he promised. Rule number one, I promise you that beyond anything else, I will not blatantly lie to you. One of our biggest problems these days is nobody knows who to trust anymore. We have Rule number four, I won't be a partisan hack. So this AMA happened on June 21st of 2017. So let's see what the Trump presidency has done up until then. January 23rd, Trump claims without any evidence that three of five million illegal immigrants voted for Hillary Clinton. January 27th, Trump bans entry from many Middle Eastern countries. February 7th, Trump appoints Betsy DeVos as his Secretary of Education, a billionaire with no experience whatsoever in education. One day later, Trump announces his cabinet with multiple former Goldman Sachs executives and billionaires lining his cabinets, including Scott Pruitt, a climate change denier to head the Environmental Protection Agency. April 3rd, Trump repeals Obama-era internet privacy protections allowing internet companies to sell your internet history. May 20th, Trump signs a $110 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia, who is now using those weapons to back a Yemeni genocide. And this is just scratching the surface. Does Dave Rubin really think that there's nothing here worth criticizing? Or is all the hysteria just keeping him from doing his job? This goes to the heart of the world that Rubin is painting within his home studio. In the world of the Rubin Report, the left is an all-encompassing juggernaut, determined to bully and shame anyone who dares to stray from the politically correct orthodoxy. And because Rubin can't think of any valid criticisms of his guests, or the right in general, they must not exist, because if anyone should want to criticize the right, it would be a liberal. If a liberal like Dave Rubin can't think of any objections whatsoever to his guests, it must be because their positions are just correct. The world of the Rubin Report is also one where the biggest problem in the world is the attack on free speech, to the exclusion of nearly all other pressing matters going on in the world right now. But in the world of the Rubin Report, the battle for free speech is only framed in a single simplistic way designed to aid the right wing. Freedom of speech is the freedom to offend, the freedom to oppose LGBT rights without being called a homophobe, and the freedom to call for a final solution without any scrutiny from the law. The world of the Rubin Report is one that might care a lot about what goes on on a college campus, but it doesn't seem to care that much about what happens in Yemen, Puerto Rico, Standing Rock, Syria, or even Capitol Hill for that matter. Finally, to close off with, I want to address any current Dave Rubin viewers. If you watch all the way to this point, thank you, and I want you to know that I get it. The mainstream media has completely failed you. For years now, they've failed to give you anything more than surface level analysis, if that. They've failed to cover the issues that you care about and that affect your lives. They've failed to present the ideological diversity and exciting ideas that you want. 
and they failed to feed the minds of you and millions of followers. And I understand that Dave Rubin promised so many of the things that mainstream media failed to give to you. But take an honest look at what Rubin has become. Rubin promised to be fair and not to be a partisan hack, yet he exclusively plays ball for the right. Rubin promised to bring you unheard and marginalized voices, but what kind of guests does Dave Rubin bring on? Ben Shapiro, who regularly appears on TV and has millions of viewers? Glenn Beck, a former Fox host with his own news company? Tucker Carlson, who has a primetime show on Fox? Jordan Peterson, who has millions of subscribers? An international speaking tour and made almost a million dollars a year on Patreon? Sebastian Gorka, a former deputy assistant in the White House? And just take a look at the kind of issues that Rubin talks about. Nearly every video is targeted against the left and the supposed threat to free speech that they pose. This is not what ideological diversity looks like. And if you have any doubts as to who Rubin is trying to appeal to, take a look around you. Look at the comment sections under all his videos. All you find is resentment for leftists, Democrats, and the ACLU. And even if you are on the right wing and you love Rubin because you want another right wing talk show on YouTube, you should at least demand that Rubin stop pretending about what side he's really on. Because whether you're on the left or on the right, I think we should all demand our media figures to have some integrity. Right? Thanks so much for watching that. If you liked it, please remember to like and subscribe. And now I'm going to introduce my Patreon. For just a dollar, you can have your name featured in my next video, which I'm going to start working on now. See ya!